Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Serena Zadan. I'm with Data Arts Business Development Team. And tonight we have gathered uh, together with my colleagues, forward thinkers of the industry, experts, to talk a bit about uh, technologies in finance practice and how do they affect uh, the current ongoing business. Uh, so I'll now pass over to my colleagues so that I can introduce them themselves and the topic they are going to uh, talk about. Please. Um, hello. My name is Alex Hilkin. I head our group for data and analytics solutions uh, in finance practice. Um, and today I'll be speaking about the trends in, in finance related to the data and, and analytics. Um, the world is changing. The finance industry always has been very smart about data and always use data to underpin its uh, existence, operations, uh, market moves. Um, today we see more and more of that. The business is becoming smarter, the business is becoming more efficient, the business models change with data and the power of, of emerging technology in data analytics space. Um, we see a few main things among our clients. Um, I classify them on three main topics. It's uh, they try to be smarter, they try to be more innovative, and they try to be more efficient. Um, being smarter, the first topic is when they try to, when they aspire to use data to get new products and services to the market, the, the better products, more granular, personalized, uh, you know, related to digital economy. Uh, things like personalized insurance policies or uh, financial products in, in banking space or something like that. Um, in a be innovative, that's enabling advanced analytics and artificial intelligence, things like that, and Oleg will be speaking a lot about that. And, and the third topic, be more efficient, is better understand markets and own operations, and uh, sometimes uh, improve your cost base, sometimes automate things. Um, all that is, is powered with the, use, with the use of data. There are a few enabling factors which kind of make that all possible. Uh, technologies have evolved a lot over the past few years. The way data solutions are built today is totally different from the way it was 10 years ago. Uh, cloud plays a huge role in it. The volumes and speed of data is growing, and businesses benefit from that. And we see more successful businesses um, using more and more of data. So it kind of leads to the business results for them, which is super important. Um, growing amounts of data, and I alluded to that, the, the business models do change. We see more and more businesses just uh, being created with their purpose of providing services which allow these businesses to collect the data and monetize the data. So happy to comment on that later in the model. Overall, uh, I think the way businesses perceive the importance of data have changed a lot five years ago. So it was all about data quality, governance, managing risk and regulation and these aspects. Today, it's a vibrant, aspiring topic for, for business leaders. They want to change, they want to innovate, they want to improve. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, please, Dennis. Yeah, hello, everyone. I'm Dennis Baranov, and I'm head of our Blockchain Center of Excellence. And what blockchain is actually everywhere? You could open newspapers, you could switch on TV, radio, and you have no chance to do not figure out blockchain somewhere here. Yeah, So it's different questions, different topics, and it's quite hype. But as my colleague said, world is changing. And right now, companies don't want to use blockchain anymore just because. So they don't trust to the blockchain anymore. Blockchain could be immutable, but who could prove that? And it's so many questions around that. And actually, what we are doing for our clients, we try to bring business value behind the technology. And that's actually one of the most important topics. Yeah, so we had so many technology around, but to bring business value, it's one of the first things which we usually try to provide to our customers. And in our center of excellence, we've done already 40 plus different projects. 
Some of them big, some of them small, but what I'm really proud of, all of them not useless. Yeah, so if we create POC, we create it to check some hypothesis. If we create a product, it has to be business case behind that. And that's why that some of that 40 project, it's already in production, it's already here. So during that speech, we probably could talk about how different technology could help. But one thing which I want to highlight behind that, yeah, so it's all technology. And right now, blockchain, it's also in cloud, yeah, so you could go to the cloud, any of AWS, Azure, or whatever you want, and use blockchain as a service. You could go and use some machine learning based on your blockchain data. So all of our topics, it's actually quite connected and not controversial at all. Yeah, so probably during our speeches, we could figure out new ideas how we could mix technology, how we could do more business with that, how we could help our clients. Because our main goal here, solve problems with technology, not create problems with technology. Thank you, Dennis. Peter, please. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm Peter Vajhansky. I'm uh, part of our finance practice based out of New York City. I help some of our customers in the financial space solve business problems with technology. Obviously, it's not me. It's our, our engineering teams and technology teams. Um, what we're seeing a lot of and what I want to focus on in these remarks is uh, we're getting a lot of interest from uh, many of our customers uh, in the area of modernizing their front end, what's called front end technology, as in what's on your screen, right? What what the users, the customers, their customers are seeing and using as they're trying to go about their jobs and execute their job functions by using technology. And there are two areas in which there's a big discrepancy between what you might want to call like a consumer experience, as in consumer technology is pervasive. We all have very smart phones and other devices, smart devices, uh, everybody's got one or several in their pockets right now as we speak, and we are getting accustomed to or are already accustomed to a certain level of experience, and there are two sport, important facets of that experience where there's a difference between the work life and the life outside work. One has to do with how easily and seamlessly things integrate with one another. Imagine your iPhone or your Android phone. phone. Typically what happens is there isn't one company that has, that has written every single application on your phone, right? You have many apps. You have app stores, you have Google Play, you have uh, uh, Apple uh, App Store. And you're able to pick and choose whatever applications you know, uh, suit your particular needs. But when they end up on your phone, they tend to work very well together, right? So if you set up an appointment in your calendar and you uh, enter a location, you're typically able to just, with one tap, go to the map and look the, at that location on the map. You can call your ride-sharing app, you know, call your taxi, Uber, Lyft, or whatever you want to do. And then from that, you can send a message and share your location. So there's all sorts of things that you can just seamlessly, without thinking, automatically just do together. And they work. You don't have to copy and paste your location from your calendar to your... If you had to do that, that would be a nightmare. So there's some level of, let's call it integration, that's somehow baked into the cake. And that makes using these devices so enjoyable and seamless. And that's why we're so happy that we have them. On the other hand, that same person that is happy using their phone, let's say, get an Uber to get to work, a finance professional, let's say, a trader or a portfolio manager, they go in, and what they're faced with is a diversity and multiplicity of different systems. The reason why there are so many systems, because what we have today, the, the reality of today, is a result of a long and complicated evolution of both financial services and the technology that, that powers financial services. And so you end up with, like I said, the multiple diverse applications that help you or are supposed to help you execute your daily job. And so any, any one professional may be faced with several, maybe even dozens of applications spread across sometimes several screens. I've seen people with, I think, 12 screens. You know, if you can imagine 12 monitors facing you, and so you have all of these different windows and you have information flashing and you have things happening. But the thing is, there's no underlying seamless integration between them. And so it's 2020 now. We're still seeing people look at the screen in one application, manually select information, copy and paste it into a notepad, then selecting something else because you, you're not able to just select the one thing that you're interested in. You have to select the whole damn thing. And then you, you copy and paste that into a third application. And you, so it's, it's a nightmarish, very manual, very tedious um, workflow um, or multiple workflows. Why can't we have an app-like experience on our work computers. 
So that is the area where there's a very exciting changes happening. Um, what would be a way out of that predicament? Well, you could say, well, let's just write one system that does everything. Well, just like there can be one app that does everything on your phone, it's just not practical. It's, it's, it's simply not going to happen. By the same token, it's going to have to be several uh, apps, but even if they're built several, uh, by uh, different people and different companies, there is a way to help those applications talk to one another on your computer so that you don't have to, to, to be the human being that integrates the applications, right? So we serve technology, that's no good. Technology should serve us. The consumer sector has figured it out. The commercial and professional software sector is beginning to figure it out. So there is an exciting technology that's uh, received a lot of boost in the, in the last two or three years. It's called desktop integration or desktop side integration. And we're doing a lot of work in that area. We're helping companies uh, simplify and streamline their workflows and just make their people more productive and reduce the toil and the frustration in their user experience at home. And the other aspect, so this is integration. The other aspect is just consumer applications and our phones are very pleasant to use and they typically are easy and pleasant to use, whereas our work applications are not. Uh, the interfaces are clean, they're intuitive, they, they follow the don't make me think principle. You can just kind of look at the screen and figure out exactly what you need to do within a minute. Not so with professional applications. It may, it may not be entirely possible, but at the same time, if you look at an application that, that, let's say it's a dominant application in the market, maybe it's been around for 20 years and people have gotten used to the experience. Have they gotten used to this clunky interface? But if we ask ourselves a question, if we were designing this application today, would we ever build this interface? And the answer is absolutely not. So the world has moved on. So those two, two areas, user experience and user interface design on the one hand, but also integration between the different applications on the desktop is the other. And, uh, we're seeing, like I said, a lot of interest, a lot of demand from our financial services customers. Um, and uh, we're happy to help them move forward in that, uh, in that area. Thank you, Peter. Oleg, please. Yeah, uh, my name is Oleg. Uh, I am a solution uh, consultant and principal consultant and data art. And I work with teams who uh, help our clients to implement different smart things. <laughs> so uh, everybody is talking uh, today about artificial intelligence, about machine learning. So we are implementing this uh, technology in practice and helping businesses to realize business value using these technologies. Um, so machine learning, the ability of machine to learn into uh, consume information and learn from information has been around for many, many years. Uh, those who graduated from universities 20 even years ago, uh, remember that they were studying these algorithms and uh, they existed uh, before. Uh, recently, availability of uh, cloud infrastructure and uh, almost unlimited uh, scalability uh, boosted uh, additional development in this area, availability of big data, uh, of big data volumes, and the ability to run the, these calculations and <coughs> algorithms on the uh, massive scale and conduct cheap experiments, uh, uh, allowed to um, implement more sophisticated m m uh, algorithms and also uh, uh, led to de democratization of uh, machine learning. So suddenly such, you know, complex uh, tools, algos became available for pretty much every business and um, uh, th that boosted um, uh, tons of new capabilities. Uh, so uh, today computers and uh, these new algos uh, can uh, recognize uh, visual Im images, can understand uh, uh, human voice and, and speech. Uh, and uh, from, uh, for, for many businesses where manual operations uh, were the part of, of the business, um, the fact that humans need to perform these operations led to uh, limited scalability, additional uh, costs. So today they have an opportunity to uh, embed these new capabilities into their uh, business process and uh, make operations cheaper, faster, and uh, re reduce cost, but uh, make them more, more scalable. A lot of work performed before by uh, humans now could be provided through uh, uh, SaaS, software as a service solutions. 
That basically boosted in another area, uh, new business capabilities, ability to invent new businesses that offer autom fully automated services. So uh, this in turn, you know, uh, uh, gave a birth to many, many new, new business um, uh, models. Uh, most popular cases uh, are uh, still uh, around uh, uh, replacement of uh, very basic work that human uh, performs, uh, let's say extract data, ex data extraction from document, entering data from uh, one to another system. And we see a lot of uh, success, especially um, uh, in global enterprises who have to involve uh, thousands of people in uh, operations, uh, but, um, you know, investment management, investment asset management companies, we see that um, use it in, an, in, an, in another way. In, uh, they are not using it for these technologies for uh, automation. Uh, they use it to derive uh, insights from huge volumes of data. Uh, so for example, uh, you can uh, predict uh, a fu future uh, revenue by of Walmart uh, by analyzing uh, 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 satellite images and understanding how many cars uh, located uh, 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 on the on parking lots and by understanding the dynamics uh, how the uh, number of parked cars changes you can predict uh, future revenues right so before. Uh, earning quarter uh, uh, annual or quarterly earnings published, you already know outcome. Well, this is just one of example, but uh, uh, basically the potential of uh, artificial and intelligence and machine learning uh, still not uh, realized fully, and uh, a lot of uh, our bigger and smaller clients just experimenting with this technology. Thank you, Oleg. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, really, really interesting topics. Um, I hope you don't mind if we try and elaborate a bit more. Uh, I ask you a couple of questions. Let's try to uh, dive a bit deeper. Let's see if we can um, share some use cases, practical information, so that this is more, uh, let's call it visible or touchable, all right, if you don't yeah. mind. Uh, uh, Dennis, I hope you don't mind. The first question goes to you, blockchain with its hype a few years ago, now it's down a bit. What, what do you think, uh, the blockchain itself, is it a temporary thing or uh, will it remain for long or, or, or if not, uh, when, when will it die or what will, what, what will actually replace blockchain technology? Yeah, it's it's amazing question. Yeah, first of all, I don't think blockchain will. Sorry, if it, sorry, if it's yeah. a, like a tricky question. But... No, it's not a tricky. Yeah, but it's fair enough question. Yeah, because you know, just two years, then we have all that spreads of the pricing around Bitcoin, around other things. We have ICOs, and guys could just say, okay, I have a blockchain in name of my company. Could you give me another twenty million? And it's real cases, yeah, so these guys have just evaluation doubled during the night, yeah, because they add blockchain into the name of the company. Right now, fortunately, we already, as you say, it in the not so hype period, yeah, so right now, more and more corporations try to use blockchain in the corporate world, and blockchain start to be just a technology yeah so and that's what i really like actually about technology then we name it just a technology yeah because i remember we had uh, so many hype around big data we had so many hype around other terms yeah so and it's not practical sometimes yeah but as soon as we name technology just a technology we immediately think about how to use it instead of use it just as a term and that's actually what happens with blockchain right now. So it's more and more uh, corporate-based solutions based on different technologies. Yeah, so we had a Calda, which quite good shape right now, and it's so many applications done on the Calda, especially in finance and insurance space. We had Hyperledger. We had other guys already on the market, yeah? And that's from one hand. From other hand, as Alec mentioned, yeah, so cloud, it's also 
enabler for many, many, many things. Because then you go to the cloud, you reduce your headache about environments, you reduce different headaches about different things, and you could do it usually faster, cheaper, or in more interest way. Yeah, so, and right now, as I mentioned previously, again, all major clouds start to provide blockchain as a service. And this is actually show up, these guys usually quite practical. Yeah, so believe me, Amazon never will use something if their clients did not ask them. Yeah, so that's the actually value proposition. Yeah, so their clients asked about that thing. So their clients start to use it. And as I said, clouds will be really, really game changers here. So to answer to your question short, blockchain already here and our clients use it in production with real project, with real data, with real value, yes. Yeah, so, but it would not change the world, yes. Yeah, so, because previously they said, okay, blockchain will fully disrupt financial industry. Yes, yeah, so it's not disrupt. It help financial industry do second step, yes. Yeah, so one more step to the future, yes. Yeah, so as machine learning will give them that step, as data will give them that step. And that's actually one thing which I really like about blockchain. Uh, that was actually brilliant. If I could just let you on to that, please, please. <clears throat> add a couple of points. One, I 100% agree. Uh, it's when we stop talking about the technology and start talking about the things that you have built with the use of that technology. It's sort of like dot com boom and internet. Internet is going to change everything. Well, it has, but at a certain point, people stop talking about internet, 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 and start talking about things that are happening on the internet, like e commerce, and you know, first and foremost, e commerce. So that's that's absolutely the way it's going to go. If if you're still talking about the technology itself, three years later, something's wrong. Like, the, you know, it's, something's wrong. And uh, the other thing, I, I was at a conference, uh, I think it was last year, and Amazon had just launched their managed ledger mm -hmm. technology, and they said, for the longest time, we had no interest in implementing blockchain because we had no uh, demand from our customers. And we're not going to build something just because it's a cool technology. We only build things that solve known and validated customer problems. But obviously, because now we know this uh, uh, ledger exists and the technology exists, it's quite clear that the businesses are demanding it. So that's, uh, that's a very good sign. Uh, so one, maybe, one, maybe yeah, yeah, I, I would like to add something. That's great, that's like, great. The more the better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, th these are uh, very good points and I just uh, want a again to uh, uh, highlight the, the importance of uh, thinking about what you want in, in business terms. Uh, so uh, all these waves of hype, uh, machine learning, AI, uh, blockchain, they create in, um, in heads of um, enterprise leaders uh, the need to move towards uh, these technologies. And they basically, we see it here and there, they come into us and ask him what I can do with blockchain, what I can do with uh, uh, AI, ML. This is good that they want to, 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 to explore it. But uh, there are you know, technologies that uh, are getting less attention uh, in, in press and in, in media. Really, really good technologies people uh, are not aware about. And in many cases, when you give them these answers, what you can do to satisfy their curiosity. You, like the next step, you ask them, but what problem are you trying to solve? And if we are lucky enough that uh, this potential customer understands the business problem that they want to solve, uh, very often the solution has nothing to do with <laughs> any of these technologies and you offering uh, something new and uh, getting a lot of excitement. So just wanted to state once again that uh, start from a business problem, be it solve uh, your current business problem or uh, have your uh, future business idea and never think about technology itself. Uh, uh, as, as you, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, you said, so we should apply that technology serves us not right the opposite, not we serve to technology. Right. Try to pick up technology, try to choose technology, solutions and so on and so on and so on. Just we, 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 uh, <laughs> as far as I understand, we have to focus on business problem. Yeah. 
Remind I, me I, to tell you. Remind me to tell you my SRE jokes, a site reliability engineer joke about people serving technology versus technology yeah. serving. People. All right, I love now we're a bit later. <laughs> I love how we technologists uh, conclude that you know we actually need to speak less and less about technology, and I, I think there is a reason for that. And technology is becoming more available, more scalable, more efficient, and this is why you actually don't need to speak about it anymore. And I think this is. And basically, in, in the data world, it's super important because before, I think, in a lot of business cases uh, related to data, technology was somewhat disabler. Like, if a business user really wants to get to a particular insight, he may want, like, uh, may, may need to wait for half a year till this particular thing gets um, implemented, and, and then it may be not relevant anymore. Maybe just as a person, he's not interested anymore. And, and think about today's world, uh, you know, uh, obviously with the situation we have today, which is the spread of the virus, um, it comes to agility of your business. It comes to the speed you can to react to particular things. And the speed is often, and more and more is actually underneath, is enabled with this powerful technology. But what you really focus is like how quickly you can React, how smart you can be. Um, you know, if you're in whatever business today, you really like every day the situation unfolds in somewhat unpredictable way. Like, you know, a week ago we were all concerned about airlines. Today, far more, you know, bigger uh, set of businesses are actually affected in somewhat unpredictable ways. Can you be smart? Can you be plugging new data sources and Quickly building models around it. Uh, that may be a difference between will you survive or not, a particular uh, crisis or downturn. I'd, an analogy I have in my head, if you remember with the virus situation, you know, a few weeks ago, China built this hospital in six days. This speed, of, this capability to execute projects like that in this timeline is the differentiator. And obviously, now we see the Chinese you know, in, in a much better place than many other countries in terms of the emerging situation, emerging crisis. The same analogy I would apply to the data in pretty much any business. Like, can you plug your data, use alternative data, new data sources, and quickly build models around it to inform your business or inform your customers and, and you know, turn threat to, to an opportunity? Yeah, very well said, and uh, especially in the world of uh, machine learning, you may have, you know, smartest uh, data science engineers, machine learning engineers, who can give you the, the best model, right? But you can have outdated infrastructure. So if it is not scalable, if you cannot deploy and redeploy your machine learning model several times a, a day, uh, tweak it, uh, you are basically putting yourself in uh, disadvantage, uh, you are getting disadvantage from, from your position. So people who are doing it more often, they uh, progress uh, faster, they react to market changes faster, and they just, you know, take in uh, your market share. <laughs> exactly. I'm actually so glad that both of you uh, jumped into the conversation and commented because I, I, I just wanted to build on, on those two points. I agree. It's, it Please. was very well said. You, 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 you use the keyword agility and um, something that you also brought into the conversation earlier, and that's uh, cloud technology. I think it's all about business agility. We, we can take your comments about machine learning and data and just take it a level higher or several levels higher. It's any technology. It's your ability to change any of your technology, uh, your ability to do it fast, to do it safely, to do it reliably, and to roll out new solutions, give it, give new technology applications, solutions, capabilities into the hands of your employees or your customers that determines your fate in the market. It's basically like this. Um, one, the one constant thing is change, right? So business agility is not a nice to have. The reason it's not a nice to have is because it's your key risk management tool. If you don't have business agility, you don't manage your risk very well. What, because the change, what determines whether the change is good or bad for you is not the change itself, not so much, at least not 100%. What determines whether the change is a good change for your company or a bad change for your company is how quickly and how well are you able to respond to that change. 
If you can't respond to that change, that change is automatically a risk. If you can respond to, your, to the change fast, then it is an opportunity. And because everything is driven by technology, essentially software runs everything, then any company that's serious about its business agility must in a way, and I know it's a sort of a, a overused phrase, but every company has to sort of in a way be a technology company. You can't hope to be good at what you do and not be good at technology. So that's why if you, if you look at the world, where does the technology and software innovation, where has that been coming from in the past decades? Well, it's the companies that do a lot of software. They happen to be in all different sectors of the economy. There's, you know, there's a TV content company, Netflix, that's, that's changed a bunch of technology and it's dr driving a lot of very constructive change. Google, Facebook, all those tech giants, right? Um, not every company needs to be a, a Netflix or a Google or can be. In fact, most companies will never even come close. But there needs to be a basic set of capabilities. So you need to be able to change your technology, again, quickly, reliably. So you have to get good with software development. You have to get good with cloud. You have to get good with data. Or if you can't do it yourself, you should use a partner like data. It's a shameless plug, but I have to. Because that's, that's, that's the whole reason we're here. That's why we're in business. That's why we're able to make a living is because we help our customers bridge that gap. Thank you. Uh, so what I will say, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm so glad everyone commented on this because my next, next question would be still trying uh, involving all of you. And as Dennis said, uh, of each of the areas we're today discussing and you are bringing on the table are interconnected. So I would like to sort of focus on one of the, uh, one of the fundamentals of, of technology, data, data. Uh, my first question would be to you, Alexei. Uh, do you think you can uh, bring a, a practical example on, on how a company, an entity, a person uh, started, um, let's call earning more money or money at all, just uh, just dealing with the data a bit differently or yeah. ap applying all the trendy things happening in data and analytics. And if, if you allow me a, a moment, I would uh, actually appreciate if uh, each of our colleagues will elaborate on this, especially you, Oleg, because uh, in my uh, understanding, uh, machine learning and AI is almost nothing without data behind it. You have to apply those algorithms to something, right? To so uh, please, uh, the stage is yours. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, in my head there are two parts to that. So one, one is you are sort of being more efficient in what you do. In a way that's also earning money because, you know, the, the big inefficiency reasons or, you know, pools of inefficiency within institutions always been, first of all, cost of your data infrastructure landscape, etc. Mm -hmm you know, with modern technology drops. Um, so that's your kind of one of the reasons for, for the profit. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, but by saying earning money, I don't mean direct uh, earns, but also, of course, optimization or cutting costs uh, yeah. uh, thanks to technology is also earning more money or yeah. spending less money, which is the same. Uh, absolutely. I mentioned that I, I see kind of two main groups. Uh, one is insight, what people tend to call inside driven organizations. That's enabling your employees, your business uh, decision makers with the data, giving them better understanding of the markets, of the customers, of the own operations of the firm, uh, analytics on how their products and services of the company perform and where to lead them and inform that with, with data and insight. I think this is the, the major major block, um, often in the projects which are related to this area, uh, we focus a lot on uh, business business scenarios first. Again, it's once again, we are not really talking a lot in, about technology itself. It's more what you, what you want to do. So we would find the business stakeholders who possibly want to use alternative data to, again, inform their product strategy. Um, they can get to more granular products and services and, and, and roll it out to the market. Um, they can, for example, in the insurance space, 
I think overarching trend we see is getting from a situation when insurer just sells policies on a huge bucket of risk, you know, health, health policies for a huge group of people. From that, they get so much more granular, they understand, you know, a, a narrow group of people and their particular maybe lifestyle and other factors which, you know, which affects your health risk. I, I am a beneficiary of that. Exactly. So a, a real life example, <clears throat> back when I was using Facebook, there was this ad that kept popping up and I, eventually I clicked on it and I realized, hi, maybe something for me. It, it said, can you run an eight minute mile? I said, do you run? Save on life insurance. And I wasn't happy with my life insurance policy because my family history on both sides is like all, all of the bad risk factors are there, right? So I'm, I'm paying quite a lot for my life insurance policy. I said, all right, let's, let's yeah. check it out. So I, I went in there and sure enough, it saves me 50% now on my life insurance policy. Oh, that's well. They were able to segment me into sort of a bucket yeah. where I am, I, I, they know I'm a lower risk and they can price me yeah. my policy lower and we both win. Sorry. I, so, I, no, no, saved, no, I saved, actually a great saved, example. Thank you. Please. I saved just 40. <laughs> Looks like you're better. Good, right? good for you. <laughs> but that's <laughs> all that great examples, but that's only the second stage. That's kind of more precise price, you know, risk assessments or analytics on any aspect of your business. But then at the third stage, it comes to more like predictive. It actually somewhat changes your business model. And the next thing Peter will see on his Facebook is Peter, like do this to change your lifestyle. So you decrease your risk and ultimately you decrease what you pay, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we mean for the business and for Peter, for everyone. So this is where it's all going just on this example. And that's category when it's kind of done in organizations and institutions and how, how uh, people within these companies engage with data and what they can do. But another example is the whole kind of data innovation rolling out new product services and, and new companies which appear in this space. Along the same lines, maybe on insurance, uh, a nice example, um, like gig economy, you know, your food delivery thing, uh, people on bicycles bringing you your, your, your lunch. Um, unfortunately, the traditional insurance space uh, didn't offer good terms for, for this kind of economy, right? Mm -hmm. To, to uh, insure your motorcycle or something. Or for example, you, you drive Uber or any other taxi service and uh, you do it one day a week. Um, in you know traditional space, you need to still in, have a commercial insurance for the entire year, and that's uh, you know okay. if you do it one one day a week, it just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. You 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 build this money on just being an Uber driver, so companies appear which are happy to insure you, not even on a day basis, on a particular trip basis, from the moment passenger comes to your car. Mm -hmm till the moment he leaves your car, and this is it. But now, if you think about it, okay, it's great, it's kind of customized uh, granular service, it's great, they can do it, but the real power comes with the understanding that this type of company rolling this type of service obtains far greater understanding of what actually happens in the real life, what sort of risk they have on their hands. They know about driver behavior and real risk far more than a company which sells annual insurance. They know, for mm -hmm. example, if it's terrible weather, this particular driver tends to go and still drive on this weather and another driver is not. So they can... So you're talking like real-time dynamic pricing based on exactly. a multitude of factors that if you sell it once a year, you yeah. just can't do that. Yeah. And they just, through this granular service, they get to the granular data and then maybe it will be not about them selling you insurance, what actually feeds the revenue to this company, but them selling this data they obtain through having the service and, well, and obtaining money. This, this has happened multiple times yeah. in a, on a meta level, right? Uh, like the Amazon story, Amazon tried to optimize its own infrastructure. When they did a good job and they were happy with their infrastructure, they suddenly realized we have a lot of excess capacity, we're provisioned for the holiday season, why don't we try and rent it out to people? And eventually they, that became the biggest driver of Amazon profits. Now what used to be their internal in-house system is now the product that everybody knows Amazon for. 
and it's driving, uh, like it's, it's the most profitable part of Amazon's business. So this plat some of our customers go through similar stories. They turn their internal technology into platforms that they sell to other people to enable them and make it a revenue stream for themselves. And yeah, the, oh, yeah I actually agree with both of them because question, your question could be actually change it a little bit. Not how you could get more revenue with data, how you could survive without data. Because data is the blood of the new world, yes? Yeah? So we have a million, million data points of each of us. Sometimes it's scary, actually, yes? Yeah? So because example of the Peter, I want to change my health insurance, yeah, and Facebook showed me some advertising, yes? Yeah? So probably this thing is fine on me. Not it's not, it's because they know so many things about you, they provide you inside of the data. And actually data is enabler, yeah? For me, it's the biggest thing. Because all that examples, it's, how we could do something new with that data, yeah? So not just use data again because of data, but provide new services. And actually selling data, it's also the big business, yeah? So because you could share it your data, you could share it your knowledge, you could share it different data points, yeah? So and provide new and new things, yeah? Because we talked about insurance quite a lot, but we came to insurance if something bad happened usually, yeah? So we do not communicate with them then our, fine, yeah, then our car or our health is fine, yes. Yeah, so, and they ask us a tons of questions, yeah, so was you drunk and you drive your car, was you, yeah, so, and I don't want to answer to that question, yes. Yeah, so, and they ask not because they do not believe into me, but they have to. And right now it's so many data-driven processes around that. So instead of you came to them, if something bad happened, like, I don't know, some waterfall around your house, yeah, so they call you before you know, yeah, so and say, oh, something wrong with your house. And yeah, and that thing that's actually helped to business be more people-oriented, yeah. And right now in all that customer markets with then customer know so many around him and have so many things which they want to try, yeah, to be people-oriented at one of the key thing of the businesses, yeah, so. Because to give your customer something before he want, that's actually the thing which help you survive in that world. No, couldn't agree more. Thank just, you, just, yes, just to please, make sure please. we we encourage everybody to drink responsibly and to never drive while intoxicated. <laughs> just, just <so> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, yeah. Maybe you step in, Oleg, with. Uh, uh, yeah, we with some insights uh, from the so, uh, ML perspective. Yeah, I, I already shared a couple of examples uh, with uh, this uh, satellite images uh, analysis, uh, same images analysis people use uh, in many, many areas, uh, agriculture, um, in um, uh, damage estimation, uh, in insurance, um, uh, and others. But, um, there are also um, uh, a lot of uh, predictive analytic uh, cases. So, uh, for example, um, uh, this standard uh, old uh, problem, the um, uh, manufacturers of, um, of the devices for and, and engines for uh, warehouses, uh, they have to to perform predictive maintenance of, of, of all this uh, uh, equipment, and ideally they should predict uh, when uh, damage is is happening. So, uh, one of our uh, clients uh, uh, came to us with a you know simple idea. Look, I have data from all these uh, devices, as we call it, the IoT to today. How can I uh, improve? How can can I predict the health? Of, of the system and uh, of equipment and in very uh, short periods of time. I, th I think everyone was expecting that this will be a large project of you know, several years or something. But I, I think in a matter of uh, uh, several months, um, engineers uh, just uh, started experimenting with uh, devices, with signals, temperature and, and others and went to production uh, six or eight years uh, later. So was- uh, Years or months? Uh, month, month, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, sorry, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, everyone was surprised and they were able to achieve uh, good results. And for predictive maintenance, they used uh, machine learning. So one of the uh, good examples. So uh, applicable in uh, many, many areas. 
in, yeah, in, pr in banking, like in, actually not only in banking, the whole finance, insurance, fraud analytics is, is a huge area where machine learning models have changed. A lot. Risk management right. as well in different areas. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Fraud and uh, again, coming back from from insurance, um, and uh, if you think about the uh, uh, insurance company, uh, in in many cases they have to uh, uh, manage a lot of logistics. Uh, so, for example, if hurricane is coming, right? Uh, they will have a spike of requests. They have to send uh, agents, and, you know, ar arrange a lot of things. Um, so now, th these days, by combining uh, data, uh, traditional data, alternative data, real-time data coming from uh, satellites, they, with high level of probability, uh, based on previous data and new data, can predict the damage. So they kind of, before the event, event happened, they already arranged in business trips of agents, uh, reservations, uh, you know, and this thing already happens uh, today in the United States. There are companies who uh, use uh, machine learning for such complex predictive analytics. This is actually incredible. I, it feels like I'm living in a sci-fi movie. Um, Gentlemen, my next question would be to Peter. Uh, however, as always, uh, all of you are uh, more than welcome to uh, step in. Uh, the technology is essential now. Uh, the innovation is great, uh, not always easy, but whatever. Uh, uh, my question would be how this uh, everything applies uh, in, in tools, internal tools and interfaces and uh, what would be your uh, comment on this? Maybe something practical on what, what's happening to the tools uh, based on these technological trends and so on. You're referring to the front end? Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like I said, uh, the, the main sort of benefit that our customers are deriving from these changes and, and uh, from the application of new front end technology is the elimination of tedious and inefficient and slow and uh, frustrating business practices and business processes where highly paid, very intelligent professionals spend their day copying and pasting data from one application to another. It's just ridiculous. Nobody, should have, nobody should have to do this at work. Actually, um, I, I, I just, I, sorry to interrupt you, just to f finish my question. My, my question should, should have finished like technology, innovation and so on, it's great, but if you don't have particular proper tools, nice looking tools, which are which are understandable, you actually cannot use those, uh, th that technology. I agree, and like, like, like we mentioned before, it's, it's sort of like this, on the cons in the consumer space, applications and technologies compete on usability. It's the more seamless you make, I, I make my, uh, your user experience, the more chances there are that you will choose my product over a competitor's product. It can be absolutely the same in terms of functionality and what can it can deliver, but if my product is easier to use or more pleasant to use or both, then I win and you lose. Um, on, in the financial technology space, among finance professionals, like I said, uh, portfolio managers or traders or trade supervisors, um, uh, other managers, um, it's sort of it's it's more that they are tolerating the horrible user interfaces and the horrible user experience. Mm. Sometimes because there is no alternative, sometimes because they simply, it, it's difficult for people to conceive of uh, a possibility of change. Well, it's always been this way. This particular tool has always looked that, like that, so we know it looks like that, so we're sort of okay with it, but not really, right? And again, no highly paid professional's time should be spent doing m manual operations like that. So the, uh, this new technology that's coming to the desktop, to the financial desktop, I think is very exciting because it gives you Again, it gives you sort of this app-like experience on your work computer, where suddenly your applications are able to understand each other. I'll give an example: if you're, if, let's say you're a trader and you're looking at a chart, and you're looking at what the price is doing of an instrument, right? So in the old world, you have to tell this charting application what instrument you want to look at. Mm -hmm. Then maybe you want to look up some reference information about the company that issued that particular. Uh, equity, that particular stock. 
you have to tell that other application the same thing. Like you want to look at, at reference information for Apple and you go Apple into one and then you go to another uh, window and you go Apple, right? Well, in the new world, you, you pick Apple in a list, let's say, and you click, you go ping one time, right? One time, you select Apple. This other window over here knows that you're looking at Apple over here. Kind of like your mapping application knows what your calendar application knows on your phone. Mm. And so your chart over here magically starts showing Apple. You don't have to tell it. You already told it behind the scenes. This is super exciting. This is how things should be. They should be easy. They should be just, you know, they should just work. Um, and so in, in consumer space, they tend to just work. In professional space, not so much. So the two are converging. That's super exciting. Okay. For me, this particular development is also exciting from another angle. We, we already touched upon the business agility aspect of pretty much any business. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the technology world, what does it mean? What, what actually was preventing business agility? It's the fact that in a, in a complex organization, there was and there still is the tendency to Built like one big system, Pizza was referring to one big cup or whatever. This concept, okay, let's have something, one thing which will underpin everything we do in our business. There is another thing which is related to that, like the way I see it. Is, uh, it's linked to the business agility, which that touched upon it before, this fact that you need to be able to change. And if you look at their technology perspective, what prevented businesses, what, what sort of stops businesses from changing? And uh, in technology, there is this big um, world monolith or you know, a thing, a, a big application or a big system or something which is from one end, it underpins everything you do in the business or a big chunk of it. But from another end, it's one thing that's difficult to change it. You, you sort of, to do anything with it, you need to change one big thing. And uh, that what is one of the key reasons why businesses are uh, you know, not changing fast. And if you look at the technology space, there were advancements in, in services. There are things like microservices, which allow you to break down these big complex things in a smaller part, so you can change them quicker independently. And that leads to overall faster evolution of whatever you have. In data world, it happened as well, like uh, the modern data architectures are very, very much assembled by different builds and blocks and pieces, and you can quickly change them. What Peter is describing is application of the same in the front-end world, in the world of user functionality, because actually there was an interesting thing in the industry once the services level was starting to break down on different components, this overarching complexity got shifted to the user interface. And companies found themselves with this huge front-end monolith they couldn't change. So uh, to me, ultimately, for sure, there is great benefits of greater user experience. But there is a also great benefits in through that allowing businesses to change quicker and the end user will see different components we just build in blocks evolve faster he will have better functionality on his screen sooner with this model which is crucial yeah i opinion. actually want to add just Please. a small piece into that puzzle which probably could help could help us to make it a little bit more complex Oh, simple, actually, you never know. <laughs> the thing is, the world is our interface. Yeah, so, and right now, it's not when we're talking about user interfaces, we shouldn't think just about mobile or desktop. We have watches, we have glasses, voice interfaces. Yeah, so it's so many things, and how your customers or your employees could communicate with your system. Yeah, so, and it's all, the world is changing and information around us, as I said, and how to represent that information, probably one of other important things which will help your business grow. Uh, th this is key because you, you touched, you, I think both of you touched on customer centricity. Um, the one other important way in which companies compete today is customer centricity. User experience, user interface is just one facet of that, but ultimately it's 
It's about making it convenient for the people that you're trying to serve to transact with you or to interact with you. It's not in the way that's convenient to you, but it's in the way that's convenient to them. In banking, you see this quite a bit. So you have these challenger banks that are reimagining the whole bank banking technology from the inside out. They're, they're, they're turning it inside out in, in many ways, right? If, if you look at a, at a banking app, you know, any bank has an app, right? But not all, all apps are not created equal. If you look at an app and you try to interact with a bank with an app, you will quickly discover how the bank is organized on the inside because you will not be able to do streamlined, straight through things on your app, even, even if it has an app. Uh, because it's not built around you as, as a customer, around what you might want to do in the real world. It's built around how the bank is organized. Because it has this division and that division, and it, ha it has one uh, division that deals with credit cards, but not checking accounts, and then the checking accounts, and then the savings account. And so, because they don't interact, then your app cannot enable that interaction on your phone. So this is, this is super important. Uh, Peter, actually, that was a brilliant comparison. Thank you. Uh, let me be honest to you. I would have stayed here for hours and hours, asked you questions one after another. However, uh, uh, we are quite limited in terms of time. So I want to thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. And I hope that uh, whoever watches this, uh, they will enjoy every single second of this conversation. Uh, and, and all the topics we've uh, dived into today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you Pleasure. for was great hosting, not just on the van, but on the city as well. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. We'll try to come back. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be waiting for you. Always welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye.